The Battle of Antietam is the single bloodiest day in American history, and on this episode of Antietam, Day of Blood, we will be looking at the opening attack by the Union Army on the Confederate left flank at Miller's Cornfield and Dunger Church. This was some of the most savage fighting of the day. All of Lee's troops were worn out and hungry, and many were sick. They watched and waited as McClellan's army assembled along the creek's east side. At about 5.30 a.m., the Union First Corps under Joseph Hooker started the attack along Hagerstown Turnpike near the cornfield. Hooker's objective was to reach and take Dunker Church on the other side of the cornfield, and Hooker had approximately 8,600 men, a little more than the 7,700 defenders under Stonewall Jackson. And this slight disparity was more than offset by the Confederate's strong defensive positions and strong artillery support. Abner Doubleday's division moved on Hooker's right. James Ricketts moved on the left into the East Woods, and George Meade's Pennsylvania Reserves Division deployed in the center and slightly to the rear. Jackson's defense consisted of the division under Alexander Lawton and John R. Jones, in line from the West Woods across the turnpike, and along the southern end of Miller's Cornfield. Four brigades were held in reserve inside the West Woods. As Union Corps marched out of North Woods, artillery batteries on both sides erupted, sparking a fierce artillery duel. The artillery duel resulted in numerous casualties on both sides, and Confederate artillery colonel Stephen Lee called it artillery hell. All of this was even before the infantry even fired a single shot. As he was leading the infantry, Hooker noticed the gleam of Confederate bayonets in the field, and he ordered his lines to stop, and he brought up four pieces of artillery to fire a canister shot into Confederate ranks. After this, there was a charge by the Union, and a savage me melee battle began and turned the entire cornfield into a melee free-for-all. Officers rode about, cursing and yelling orders no one could hear in the noise and it became very confused. Rifles became hot and fouled from too much firing. The air was filled with hell of bullets and shells. As the fighting in the cornfield became intense, Meade's 1st Brigade of Pennsylvanians under Brigadier General Truman Seymour began advancing through the East Woods and exchanged fire with Colonel James Walker's Brigade of Alabama, Georgia, and North Carolina Infantry. As Walker's men forced Seymour's back, aided by Lee's artillery fire, Rick's division entered the cornfield, also to be torn up by artillery. As time went on, more numbers began to tell. The Louisiana Tiger Brigade, under Harry Hayes, entered the fray and forced the Union back to the East Woods. The Tigers were beaten back eventually when the Federals brought up a battery of three-inch ordnance rifles and rolled them directly into the Union cornfield point-blank fire that slaughtered the Tigers, some of them losing their heads. The Louisiana Tigers ended up losing 323 of their 500 men in this action. The Union attacks in the West Woods were faring better, but there were still severe casualties. Brigadier General John Gibbons' 4th Brigade of Doubleday's Division, recently named the Iron Brigade, who would see later fame at Gettysburg, began advancing down and stride the turnpike into the cornfield and in the West Woods, pushing aside Stonewall Jackson's men. They were stopped by a charge from Stark's brigade, leveling heavy fire from 30 yards away. The Confederate brigade withdrew after being exposed to fierce return fire from the Iron Brigade, and Stark was mortally wounded. After briefly stopping, the Union attack on Dunker Church continued and punched a hole in Stonewall Jackson's line. Confederate reinforcements arrived just after 7 a.m., and the divisions under McClaws and Richard H. Anderson arrived following a night march from Harper's Ferry. Around 7.15 in the morning, General Lee moved George T. Anderson's Georgia Brigade from the right flank of the Army to A. Jackson. At 7 a.m., Hood's division of 2,300 men advanced through the West Woods and pushed Union troops back through the cornfield again. The Texans attacked with such ferocity because as they were called from their reserve position, they were forced to interrupt the first hot breakfast they had had in days. They were aided by three brigades of D.H. Hill's division arriving from the Mama Farm southeast of the cornfield and by Jubal Early's brigade pushing through the West Woods from the Nicodemus Farm where they had been supporting Jeb Stewart's horse artillery. Some officers of the Iron Brigade rallied men around the artillery pieces of Battery B, 4th U.S. Artillery, and Gibbon himself saw to it that the previous unit did not lose a single caisson. 
At this point, the battle started to stretch away from just the west woods and the cornfield, and more Confederate divisions were brought up to protect the mainly right flank, which at this point was starting to be exposed. Hood's Texans held the line and saved the Confederate line from collapsing, but at the price of 60% casualties. When an officer asked Hood where his division was, Hood responded, Dead on the field, sir. Hooker also sustained heavy casualties, about 2,500 men in two hours, and they were right back where they had started from earlier that morning. It is estimated that the cornfield changed hands no more than 15 times in the course of the morning, and just eight hours in, there were over 15,000 casualties. Hooker called for support from the 7,200 men of Mansfield's 12th Corps. About half of Mansfield's Corps were fresh recruits, and Mansfield was also inexperienced, having taken command only two days before. Although he was a veteran of 40 years' service, he had never led large numbers of soldiers into combat. Concerned that his men would bolt under fire, he marched them in a formation that was known as Column of Companies Closed in Mass a bunched-up formation in which a regiment was arrayed ten ranks deep instead of the normal two. As his men entered the West Woods, they presented an excellent artillery target, almost as good a target as a barn. Mansfield himself was shot in the chest, and he ended up dying the next day. Afias Williams assumed temporary command of 12th Corps. Even with the fresh numbers, still no progress was made. The second division of 12th Corps, under George Sears Green, however, broke through McRae's men, who fled under the mistaken belief that they were about to be trapped by a flanking maneuver. The breach of the line forced Hood and his men, who were at this point outnumbered, to regroup in the West Woods, where they had started the day. Green was able to reach the Dunker Church, Hooker's original objective, and drove off Stephen Lee's batteries. Federal forces held most of the ground to the east of the turnpike. Hooker attempted to gather the scattered remnants of his first corps to continue the assault, but a Confederate sharpshooter spotted the general's white horse and shot Hooker through the foot. Command of his first corps fell to George Meade, since Hooker's senior subordinate James B. Ricketts had also been wounded, but with Hooker removed from the field, there was no general left with the authority to rally the men of the 1st and 12th Corps. Green's men came under heavy fire from their west woods and withdrew from Dunker Church. In an effort to turn the Confederate left flank and relieve the pressure on Mansfield's men, Sumner's 2nd Corps was ordered at 7.20 in the morning to send two divisions into battle. John Sedgwick's division of 5,400 men was the first to ford the Antietam Creek, and they entered the East Woods with the intention of turning left and forcing the Confederates south into the assault of Brand Ambrose Burnside's 9th Corps. But the plan went very wrong. They became separated from Way H. French's division, and at 9 a.m. Sumner, who was accompanying the division, launched the attack with an unusual battle formation. The three brigades were in three long lines, men side by side with only 50 to 70 yards separating the lines. They were assaulted first by Confederate artillery, and then from three sides by the divisions of Early, Walker, and McClaws and in less than half an hour, Sedgwick's men were forced to retreat in great disorder to their starting point with over 2,200 casualties, including Sedgwick himself, who had been taken out of action for several months by a wound. The final part of the fighting around the cornfield in Dunker Church, also known as the Morning Phase, was around 10 a.m., when two regiments of the 12th Corps advanced, only to be confronted by a division of John G. Walker, newly arrived from the Confederate right. They fought in the area between the cornfield and the west woods, but soon Walker's men were forced back by two brigades of Green's division, and the federal troops seized some ground in the west woods. The morning phase ended with casualties on both sides of almost 13,000, including two Union Corps commanders. Fighting around Dunker Church and Miller's cornfield was mostly done, but the worst was yet to come. On the next episode of Antietam Day and Blood, we will take a look at the Sunken Road, also known as Bloody Lane.